My vision was totally different. I felt that I was born for something special, for something unique, for something big. I'd go back to the top of the stairs and come back down in slow motion. My mom would be at all my sporting events. Let's say I was playing football, okay? My mother would be on the sidelines, and if the play on the field started going one way, my mother would run along like, Mark, get him, get him! I'd be like, oh my gosh. I'd get in the huddle with the other guys, they go, Mark, is that your mother? I go, no, I never saw her before in my life. <laughs> the greatest gift my mother ever gave me, she believed in me. I have overdosed on drugs on three occasions where I should have been dead. But I believe I was kept here for a reason. You show me your friends, I will show you your future. How do I know this? I hung out with losers and I became the biggest loser of them all because I gave up everything I dreamt about as a little boy because of who I chose to surround myself with. My friends would drive me home at two, three, four in the morning. We'd be drunk and high, laughing in the car. We pull up in front of my house in New York, they go, Mark, Mark, the light's on. I go, oh man, my mother's up. See, my mom wouldn't go to bed until she knew her son was still alive. I'd walk in, she'd say, hi Mark, how was your night? I go, it was good mom, I'm just gonna go to bed. She goes, can I, can I talk to you for a minute? I go, mom, I'm tired, I'm just gonna go to bed. She goes, Mark, I haven't seen you all day and all night, can I please talk to you? I said, man, just leave me alone, you bug me. I'd slam my bedroom door on the one person who believed in me. I was on a worldwide tour and we were wrestling overseas in Japan. After my wrestling match, I went upstairs in my hotel room and I fell asleep. There was a knock at my door at three o'clock in the morning. I got out of bed and I looked through the safety window and I could see it was a Japanese promoter. So I opened the door and he said, Mark, you need to call home. There's been an emergency. I went and got on the hotel room phone. I called back to the United States and said, hey, what's going on? They said, Mark, I don't know how to tell you this. I said, just tell me what happened. All of a sudden they started crying. They go, Mark, I can't tell you. I said, just say it. They said, Mark, your mother died. I just threw the phone down. I ran out of my hotel room. I took the elevator to the lobby and when the doors opened up, I just ran out into the street. I mean, there was no cars, there was no people. It was three o'clock in the morning. And I walked down the middle of a street in Hiroshima, Japan. And I remember looking up and just saying, Mom, I am so sorry. I flew home for her funeral and I was so nervous to walk up to her casket. So I just stood way in the back. And I kept looking from a distance. I kept thinking to myself, Mom, please wake up. Please get up. And then I finally got the nerve to walk up to her. And as I got closer, I could see my mom for the first time. I mean, she was so beautiful. She, she was dressed in white. I mean, she looked like an angel. And I just stood over and I said, Mom, you are my hero. Everything I am, everything I hope to be was because of you. You loved me so much, you gave me a life. You're the only one that ever believed in me. How did I repay her? By getting drunk, by getting high, by getting stupid, by hanging out with losers, for what? All she ever wanted to do was talk to me. I wish I could talk to you now, Mom. I wish you could see what I'm doing. Why couldn't I have been a better son? We are defined by our choices. But if you surround yourself with people involved in drugs and alcohol and pills, it's a dead end. I'm not here to preach to you. I'm here to tell you I live that life. It leads to broken hearts, broken relationships, broken dreams, and death. For what, to get high? If you have a mother or a father, when you go home, tell them how much you love them. See, my whole life was about 
being rich and famous. I had to be a millionaire. I had to win the race. I had to win the race to expense my marriage, my family, my friends for what? To be all alone in the world? I learned what is truly important, and that is how precious this gift of life is and our families and how quickly it can be taken away. See, I no longer live in time. I live in moments. See, it's not what's in your pocket that matters. It's what's in your heart that truly matters. Love, love is just a word until somebody comes along and gives it meaning. You, you're the meaning. And, and so today my life makes sense, but, but the minute you think you know everything, at that moment you know nothing. And so I was in India and I was teaching a, a course on leadership in India and I, I, I had gone to this, this, this uh, university and I had spoke there and after I left, I, I got back to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the hotel, I realized I didn't have my wallet. And so I called the hotel and I said, can you please bring the car back, they have my wallet. And they said, I'm sorry sir, we don't have a car, that was a taxi we used. And so they tried calling the taxi company, nobody answered the phone. They tried again and nobody answered the phone. And I became a little cynical. I went from hopeful to skeptical to cynical and I started thinking the worst of people. And of course they said, well my, my wallet is gone. By midnight they called and said, we're still trying. He's not answering the phone, the taxi cab driver. But at two in the morning they called and said, he answered his phone, his phone was off. He's coming back to your hotel with your wallet. So I get dressed and I run down stairs and a man meets me and the bellman translates in for me in India in the dialect and, and, I, and I ask the man, well, how, and I get my wallet and everything is in my wallet, everything. My passport, my money, my credit cards, it's all there and I reach into my wallet and there's $70 US. I ask the man through a translator, what do you make a month? He says about 2,500 rupees, which about, with that time, which is about $70 US. So I reach out and I say, let me give this $70 to you. This is my way of saying thank you. And the man says, no. I said, no, I don't think you understand. I have one month's salary for you. I want to say thank you. Here's $70. And the man says to the translator, no. And I said, there must be a translation problem here. I'm talking about paying you. I'm talking about giving you a month's worth of your salary. One more time, he said, and this time he became a little visibly younger. He said, angry, he said, I told you no. I didn't bring you your wallet because I wanted a reward. I brought you your wallet because it's your wallet. Now this may not sound like an incredible story, but think what would have happened if I had lost my wallet in a taxi in New York City or a big city anywhere in, in the world. Think about what a, the chances of me getting my wallet back. Think about it and be honest with yourself now. This is a slum, so they, as they call it, in India. So I said to the man, what can I do to be thankful to you? What can I do to say thank you? He said, well, the next time you're in India, come to my house and have tea. Be my friend. I mean, as you know, I was born in 1947 in Austria after the Second World War. So I was very fortunate that I stumbled onto my vision. And I didn't really like Austria when I grew up. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I couldn't see myself becoming a farmer or a worker in a factory or anything like that. Even though my parents wanted me to stay there and have a normal life. But that was their vision, not mine. My vision was totally different. I felt that I was born for something special, for something unique, for something big. Then one day I went to school. I remember I was 11 years old. And they showed a documentary about America. And there they showed in this documentary the huge skyscrapers, the high rises, the huge bridges, the six lane freeways, and all of this stuff in the same myself. That's where I want to be. I don't want to be around here with these little farmhouses and these little buildings. I want to be in America. One day after school, I walked by a store in Graz. So I went inside and I looked around and then I saw a magazine. I saw a bodybuilding magazine that had Reg Park on the cover. Reg Park was then a three-time Mr. Universe. And I saw him on the big screen as Hercules. 
I read that and I said to myself, wow, this is the blueprint for my life. This is exactly what I want to do. I want to become a bodybuilding champion just like Reg Park. I want to get into movies just like Reg Park. And I want to make millions of dollars and be rich and famous just like Reg Park. Do you know how great it felt that I knew where I was going? Imagine the majority of people don't know where they're going. I knew where I was going, that I'm going to become this bodybuilding champion just like him. So it was just a question of how do you do it? I was so relieved because when you have a goal, when you have a vision, everything becomes easy. So people always ask me when they saw me in the gym in the pumping iron days, they said, why is it that you're working out so hard? Five hours a day, six hours a day, and you have always a smile on your face. And I told people all the time, I said, because to me, I'm shooting for a goal. In front of me is the Mr. Universe title. So every rep that I do gets me closer to accomplishing that goal, to make this goal, this vision turn into reality. Every single set that I do, every repetition, every weight that I lift will get me a step closer to turn this goal into reality. So I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound squat. I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound bench press. I couldn't wait to do another 2,000 reps of sit-ups. I couldn't wait for the next exercise. With the age of 20, I went to London and I won the Mr. Universe contest as the youngest Mr. Universe ever. And it was because I had a goal. So let me tell you something, visualizing your goal and going after it makes it fun. You've got to have a purpose no matter what you do in life. You've got to have a purpose. Now fear is going to be a player in your life. But you get to decide how much. You can spend your whole life imagining ghosts, worrying about the pathway to the future, but all there will ever be is what's happening here and the decisions we make in this moment which are based in either love or fear. So many of us choose our path out of fear disguised as practicality. What we really want seems impossibly out of reach and ridiculous to expect, so we never dare to ask the universe for it. I'm saying I'm the proof that you can ask the universe for it. Please. <laughs> And if it doesn't happen for you right away, it's only because the universe is so busy fulfilling my order. <laughs> my father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want, so you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. I watched the effect of my father's love and humor and how it altered the world around me, and I thought, that's something to do. That's something worth my time. It wasn't long before I started acting up. You know, people would come over to the house and they'd be greeted by a seven-year-old throwing himself down a large flight of stairs. <laughs> they would say, what happened? And I would say, I don't know, let's check the replay. <laughs> I'd go back to the top of the stairs and come back down in slow motion. <laughs> As someone who's done what you're about to go and do, I can tell you from experience, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. <clears throat> because everything you gain in life will rot and fall apart, and all that will be left of you is what was in your heart. Who oh, I'll be telling something, a speech right now. Either you work hard for it, or you don't work hard for it. Well, me and my brother, we work hard for our stuff. 
It don't come easy. In life, you have to work. Either you want to be the shark of the ocean or the fish of the ocean. And right now, you want to be the shark. Take over everything. Strength, no weakness. Power, the muscle. You have to have that mindset. So you're going to come in here and dominate. When you say, oh, something wrong. No, no, no. Don't put yourself down. Motivate yourself, keep yourself up, pumped, and ready for any challenge. 